At Maverick Public Relations, Growing Your Influence is their specialty. MPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. One of the other things that attracted me to this opportunity, as I mentioned, was this relationship with Jay-Z and Rock Nation. And in a very crowded, cluttered space, you actually need people that can help you cut through that clutter and, and to influence culture. Well, I think you guys just saw the halftime show that Jay-Z and Rock <laughs> Nation produced. Like they, these folks can really drive and shape culture, uh, American culture, global culture. And that's what's different about what we have in our back pocket versus everyone else. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Troy Datcher, CEO of The Parent Company. Troy, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, guys. It's great to be with you. Excited to dive in. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really good. Excited to, to bring it back to the West Coast, to the roots. Uh, how are you, Brian? I'm doing well. And yes, Troy is on the West Coast, but I think there is some East Coast love we'll get into today. So, Troy, for our listeners that want to get a little background about you and how you got in the cannabis space. Yeah, um, you know, six months ago, I was sitting at my desk at Clorox managing supply and demand issues during the worldwide pandemic. You could probably say my job was pretty cake as the leader of global sales for a disinfecting products company in the middle of the pandemic. You know, while you don't, we don't wish any of those bad things on anyone across you know, the globe, it's been tragic. Um, you know, Clorox worked for 100 years to build a brand for that very moment. And that trust that comes along with that brand really kicked into action. So, yeah, my uh, six months ago, I was managing, you know, those tough conversations with retailers who so were balancing supply and demand across the globe. And I got this random phone call um, from a recruiter. And I always take phone calls because they kind of led me to some interesting places across my career. So I, you know, was at Procter & Gamble for many years, left Procter & Gamble to go to Clorox because I was listening and heard the opportunity. I left Clorox when I worked in NASCAR for a number of years because I was listening. I went back to Clorox because I was listening. And then this, this call came through about cannabis. And I was one of those guys who was poking holes in the industry from the outside as it was developing, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, everything that was happening. And I thought it was pretty hypocritical for me not to at least listen to the opportunity. And then at the parent company, I got a chance to see all the ingredients and just felt like they had all the right ingredients to something great. And then you toss in, uh, you know, the opportunity to shape an industry and be a part of that conversation and working with Jay-Z and Rock Nation. I mean, kind of puts it over the top. So um, that, that's why I'm here. And uh, But I was in my dream job. I, I, I worked my entire career for 30 years to be a C-suite executive at a Fortune 500 company running a global organization. That's what I thought I wanted to do until I got this phone call. And I, I'm so grateful that you shared that. But in, given the timing of the situation, it wouldn't have surprised any people if, if you pass on that. So I, I want to kind of stay with that conversation. Was there something in that moment? Was it someone that pitched to you? Was it something that connected with an inner core? You know, take us through behind the scenes on that conversation. Yeah, I think uh, what really sparked it for me was the purpose piece of the conversation. You know, the parent company has a stated objective to be the most impactful company in the cannabis industry. That's not just dollars and cents and bottom line stuff. It's also how do you bring inclusion, diversity, equity into the marketplace. And that really spoke to me. You know, the, one of the things about working for a company like Clorox was that we, we were grounded in purpose. Like we actually knew who we were and why we, were, we existed. And um, when they started to speak to me about purpose, I, they really lured me into the conversation. And that's really the only way I could explain to my friends and family and my mom, by the way, <laughs> that I was going to go work in cannabis. It was really about this purpose-driven objective and you know, we're doing some things around social equity that are really important. We want to be the example when it comes to that work. You know, I'm having some great conversations with folks who are trying to figure out how to, to uh, change some of these antiquated drug laws and get some people out of prison who are doing something that I did. I'm doing legally today that that was considered illegal just a couple of years ago. And those kinds of things are really interesting and important. And, you know, I think if we can shape the right equitable industry from the beginning, and the parent company had a little bit to do with that, then it's been all worth it. So that that's really, you know, the purpose piece was the, the reason why I came over. 
Uh, other than that, like it, I would have never, ever left my opportunity at Clorox. I, you know, I've been with the organization for 22 years. You actually develop a bit of comfort. You know, I was part of the DNA of the company while the company had been around for a hundred years. I've been around for a large part of that hundred years and was shaping culture at the company. I had a lot of freedom to be who I am. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, you know, comfort that comes with that. But, you know, this was just too, too interesting of an opportunity to pass up for sure. I have, a, I have a quick question about the, the Clorox experience. I mean, working for Clorox, it's a global company in over, what, uh, 100 different countries. And yeah. they manage chemicals, right? So probably a super highly regulated industry. How much of that experience translated over to, to cannabis from a regulatory perspective? Well, the, the good news, I think, is that I understood that, that uh, regulations have to be considered. You have to really understand the landscape you're competing in. So that was helpful. Other than that, nothing translates, right? You know, uh, you know the regulations that a, a company like Clorox deals with, with the FDA uh, and the EPA and others. Um, those, 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 those organizations. We know all the the key stakeholders there. We know all the rules, and we were able to uh, to to work hand in hand with them. And uh, I, I think, as any emerging industry, you're just trying to find your way. Um, you're trying to push the envelope to get the right conversation started around things that aren't helpful to the industry um, as we're trying to, uh, to to build it from the ground up. You know, Clorox had decades of experience of working with those agencies and, and, and helping to shape and influence policy. And we're just at the start of that. But, but understanding that there are rules and regulations and there's a sandbox that you must play within, uh, you know, that, that is very familiar to me. And something that I took from that experience and brought to this one for sure. So, you know, timelines and deadlines are often dictated and impacted by those regulations. Um, and so those are things you have to consider, especially as, you know, someone who's trying to drive innovation and change in the industry, you've got to keep those things in mind. And with Clorox, right, there's an established industry, there's, there's big mega players. And right now we are still so in the infancy stage. So when you're taking the reins, you're kind of like opening up the force and leading the direction, which I hand you a ton of credit for kind of diving in and being ready to be uncomfortable again, because obviously with cannabis, there is that. So let's, let's start with your first couple of days on the job. Obviously, cannabis is full of challenges and there's tons of opportunities and tons of unknowns. So for you, who's, who's at the helm of a vertically integrated large player, What's the first couple of days like? What's the first objective you're taking on? You know, take us through that experience. Yeah, for me, it was all about learning. And, and, and the, at the core of that is listening. I spent a great deal of time trying to put myself in the shoes of people in the organization. So I've been playing a bit of undercover boss, you know, showing up in places, kind of inspecting like what's happening across the organization. Uh, I, I, I should change that word. It's, it's not really inspecting. It's actually observing. Uh, I don't have enough information to inspect anything or enough experience to inspect anything or tell someone they're doing something wrong. It's really just observation. So, you know, on, on, on day two, I got a chance to meet, meet with folks from Jay-Z's team to really understand, you know, the quality uh, that's expected for Monogram and the rules of engagement with them. Um, but on day three, I was, I was actually out on a delivery uh, route with, with my delivery drivers to better understand that part of the operations. I spent the better part of the week in our operations to understand cultivation, uh, you know, all, all of our, uh, call it the back-end work that goes into developing our products and spent some time in our dispensaries next to our bud tenders as they're making recommendations to, to folks as they enter in, a, in our location. So I, I really uh, spent time across the entire ecosystem just trying to observe and learn. Uh, you know, I think one of the, my jobs is to serve as as a general manager for the business, say looking at all the 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 uh, the puts and takes of building a uh, a really great organization, that that includes uh, seeing everything from seed to sale and, and making really tough trade off choices in between. And so my job is really up front to just listen. Um, and next week, for example, I'm headed out to see our retail outlets. Um, we have a new VP of retail, and I'm going to go out and just talk to our, st our store managers and our and the folks that work on the front lines and just better understand what we could be doing differently. So a lot of listening uh, is, is what I, I'd say the, the first couple of months have been. And now it's really about uh, taking some action. Uh, you know, we've 
brought in a consulting group, the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, who have actually have some experience with it at Clorox building a corporate strategy. They helped me just take a look at our strategy as a company, put a fine tune on, on that narrative. Uh, and then we're at now deploying that internally. And I'll be talking about that externally to key stakeholders over the next couple of months. But observing, now that I've observed a bit, you know, leaning into some decisions to really provide a, a really a, tr- a clear, true north for the organization, which I'm really excited about. So the, the parent company is vertically integrated, meaning they touch each portion of the supply chain. So was there one portion of the supply chain that kind of came a lot easier from a learning perspective and another one that was more challenging? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've, I've been in sales for 30 some odd years. And so understanding the sales component of what we do um, was was easily translatable to the things I've done in the past. Um, you know, my while my family's farmers, I grew up in Alabama, my family were farmers back there. I knew as a young kid, I didn't want to be a farmer. So like, I stayed away from all the cultivation stuff. <laughs> and, and so I'd say I'm learning a lot about that. That's been an a, a interesting learning curve for me. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time at retail, uh, obviously in my consumer products package these days. And a lot of that stuff ex- translates in terms of, you know, how do you create an experience for shoppers and what things are important. So those things translate really well. Um, but, you know, what, what I'm not accustomed to is something you mentioned at the very top of the conversation is a lot of the rules and regulations. Like there's a lot of that that I'm learning. And so, um, you know, just understanding the the boundaries in which we're, we're you know, the box that we're placed in. Uh, to get, compete is is something I'm spending a lot of time learning. But yeah, the vertically integrated approach is a very interesting one. One, it's expensive to do, yes. right? Um, and uh, and two, it's, it's challenging because you really need to be good at everything. And what I find is most organizations can be great at some things and okay at others. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the advantage though of being vertically integrated is is obviously we're trying to build brands here and in building brands, you have to build, uh, make a promise to consumers. And when you own every aspect of, of the relationship from seed to sale, you can make that promise. And I'll give you an example. You know, if the product quality is not good, we can blame ourselves. We don't blame a third party cultivator um, because we own that part of the, the relationship. If you walk into our dispensary and we you have a really bad experience, well, we own the dispensary and we own the relationship between the consumer and, and the folks who are or in that in that dispensary. Uh, if your order shows up at your home at your doorstep and it's late and incomplete, we own that relationship. And so, I know you guys have probably all used third party companies to deliver something to your home, whether that's a meal or. Or, or something from your favorite store. And, and if the order is not on time or complete, like who do you blame? Do you blame the store itself, the restaurant itself? Do you blame the entity? Like who do you call? Like you guys know all the challenges associated with that. And this gives us opportunity to own that relationship and learn along the way. Now, what I envision long-term is we won't be doing all these things long-term. The, the industry will mature. There'll be people that you can rely on to help deliver the promise with you. Um, we'll understand what your expectations are in making that promise and you'll be able to lean on them. But we're just not at that stage yet in terms of maturity in the industry. I think we'll get there, um, but we're not there quite yet. And operational excellence that comes with that, right? Owning every part of the supply chain means you have to kind of spend resources and time and costs and have experts in every level, which has its own challenges, but then kind of allows for extra data insights. And I know you're a big fan of some data insights. So I want to kind of pick your brain on that. Are there certain metrics that you use internally that apply from Clorox over to the parents company in order to kind of understand more about that, that consumer experience and then be able to replicate that back through the supply chain to make more informed, better decisions? Yeah, data is, you know, in my DNA. Um, And, you know, we, we don't have as much, you know, robust data as, as I, what I'm accustomed to. It's actually been a bit liberating to, you know, I think, you know, we can lean on our experience, our gut uh, a bit more here. And, and I, I like that, actually. It, it allows you to move with more speed. Uh, so you're not waiting for more data to make a decision. But but data is our friend. And, you know, one of the, 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 the benefits of having this seed to sell relationship, this, you know, direct to consumer platform that we have is we're collecting data along that journey. So we can be better innovators because we actually know what's working. We, we know 
uh, that we should have a more personalized relationship with consumers because we are collecting more data. That's an expectation every consumer has today. And so I'm excited about the data journey that we're all on. Uh, and I think that's going to be our best friend. But but we have some advantages there that we're, we're starting to lean in and take advantage of. And I'll give you an example. We, we now know, for example, uh, pricing strategies, like what really works for what brands. You know, we that's a really big learning, new learning uh, example for us. You don't have to discount everything that you sell. Um, some things don't respond to that. Uh, we know what brands really move the needle. So when we take our resources and put it against a brand to feature it in our ecosystem, like what brand really moves the needle? Instead of just throwing things at the wall, we can actually have a more intelligent cadence of promotional activity based off of what really works. So that's what's exciting. And, you know, I was just having a conversation with one of our partner brands and they wanted to move into a, a, a new category space, uh, primarily because uh, it's, a, it's a fast growing segment. But we looked at our data and said, hey, we, we actually don't think your brand can travel to that new form factor. But here's, in our data we've uncovered, here's a place where the, it can go. And so we can now make more intelligent bets when it comes to innovation and uh, evolving our portfolio based on the data we're collecting. And so that, that part's really exciting. But we're just on the very like tip of what data can really do to help us be better and be smarter. And that, and that yeah. I'm really excited about. But it's going to take some effort, um, you know, bring in the right level of expertise, people who are used to working with data to turn it into insights, uh, something I'm very accustomed to. And then secondly, um, making sure you got the right tech structure to, to, to bring that to life and make it turnkey for folks. And we got some work to go uh, and make some investments in that area to, to really uh, become the company that we want to be in that, in that area. How do you guys balance that like uh, kind of emotion, I guess, in terms of that brand approach to you said, we want to be in this form factor. So clearly there's some sort of emotion driving that besides just the, they think it's a good opportunity, right? With what the data says, because this industry is so new. So that mentality of making data-driven decisions is probably not um, very robust in terms of how traditionally the decisions have been made in the space. So how do you kind of balance that emotional uh, aspect with the, the data aspect? Well, if I don't win the, the war by giving them the data, which I'm not convinced that always that works, um, the good news is that we actually have a contained ecosystem to test these ideas before we bring it to rest of market. So for example, the case I just mentioned, I won't mention the brand name of the person who's pushing me on this, but I will tell you this. Um, worst case scenario, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the product, we're gonna put it in our 11 dispensaries and on our uh, delivery platform. We're gonna test it. And then we're gonna bring the data back and say, hey, either we were right, like the data told us beforehand, and now we, we actually have confirmation that has no traction, or we were wrong and let's lean in and pour fuel on the fire. Let's, let's bring this to the rest of the market. But we have an opportunity to, you know, do a micro test, a contained test of, of, of these ideas, quickly assess if they're worth it or not, and then expand them out if they are. That's something unique and, you know, not something that I had at my disposal, whether working at Procter & Gamble or Clorox, really to have that opportunity to test things before bringing the rest to market. Most companies in, in consumer products packages because they're working really hard now to build their dot-com business, uh, that direct-to-consumer business, so that they can use it as a testing ground. But it's something they're trying to retrofit into their playbook versus the opportunity that we have here, which is just to do it from the ground up. I think it's, all, it's also so interesting too, right? You can do limited quantity drops to kind of build the hype. And if it plays and, and aggressively moves, you can kind of go back to the drawing board and go, hey, maybe we need to do more established drops with this brand and push this because you're right. Like owning every piece of the supply chain allows you to understand these different areas and then allows you to test things and then pull them off the shelf. If it's not working, it never really existed. But if it did work, now we've maybe uncovered something that allows that. So when you were joining the parent company, was the brands one of the key assets in that decision-making process? You were saying, hey, the ability to kind of align with these brands that are maybe just local now, but could translate globally in the future. Is, was that one of the key, key parts in your decision? Yeah, that's the exciting part. I mean, you really hit it on the head, Brian. I mean, it's uh, to have an opportunity to um, build brands that can travel outside of the state of California. It's really exciting. 
you know, I'm a big believer that California will have a large say so uh, on what this industry looks like long term. And I think brands will be at the center of that. I joke around with my friends, you know, I say, hey, they grow grapes in Georgia and in North Carolina, but you buy your wine from California. And I do believe the same thing is going to be really true with cannabis. There'll be, you know, a, a lot of, uh, I, I think, energy from California that will translate into uh, building brands outside of the state. And um, if we can make it here, we can make it anywhere, I think is the term like for New York, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you can survive California where there's thousands of brands and tons of clutter, if you can come out of this um, standing with a brand that makes a a place in the market, you you can then take that and translate that out to the rest of the market. I, I firmly believe that. And that's what's exciting about this opportunity is, you know, there are a few brands who have a head start there, but not a lot. You know, there's going to be some folks who choose to be the Walgreens or Costco of, of cannabis. Like they're going to have a dispenser on every street corner. That won't be us. There are going to be some folks who are the, the best cultivators in the entire industry. Those folks have a really good head start and that likely will not be us. But what we can do is we can build brands that deliver against the promise. That has not been for fully captured, I think, yet. It hasn't been. That market hasn't been cornered. And I think there's an opportunity for us to do exactly that. And I think you have another asset rolled up your sleeve, which is the influencer partnership, because the reach that your team can bring is, is almost unparamounted, right? There's almost no one who, if, if you sent out a mass email and say, hey, we're making an announcement about this, everyone sent out your social channels. I can't even imagine what that type of impressions would be. It would be off the charts. So from an influencer partnership standpoint, in the cannabis industry, it's kind of split perspective on if if it's beneficial or not, given the relationship. So is that a core strategy piece? And can we expect Rock Nation members to be a part of product categories in the future? Yeah, you know, I, one, one of the other things that attracted me to this opportunity, as I mentioned, was this relationship with Jay-Z and Rock Nation. And in a very crowded, cluttered space, you actually need people that can help you cut through that clutter and, and to influence culture. Well, I think you guys just saw the halftime show that JG and Rock Nation <laughs> produced. Like they, these folks can really drive and shape culture, uh, American culture, global culture. And that's what's different about what we have in our back pocket versus everyone else. Um, but the way that we think about influence and celebrity is it actually has to be born in authenticity. And I think that's what's probably missing with some relationships that you see. And there's a lot of folks as I've joined the organization who say, when are we going to see Jay-Z in an ad for a monogram? Well, that's not how this thing works. There's never been the promise that we, we made with that relationship. Jay-Z is a visionary. He's behind the scenes. He actually helps provide you know, that long-term vision that any industry needs, any company needs, any brand needs as they're trying to be relevant, not only today, but for decades. And, uh, you know, you're not going to see billboards with, you know, with, with Jay uh, being featured. You know, they, they, they're, the way they build brands is through authenticity and connection. And, you know, the fact that that monogram is really grounded in pointing out the hypocrisy in the drug laws and, and that it's built on the promise of providing equity and inclusion to the industry. That's what's great about monogram. It's less about the Jay-Z connection. It's more about the purpose in which it's grounded on, which Jay stands for. You know, as I think about our relationship with Mariah and, and Santana, it's all about born in authenticity. Cannabis has been a part of his life forever. We're not looking for relationships with people that are interested in this industry because it's an emerging growth industry that can, can line people's pockets. It has to be born in authenticity of like how the person's used the product, how they incorporate it to their lives something that is more uh, born out of a connection to, to what they're trying to get accomplished versus just uh, a name and, uh, you know, and, and awareness because you're famous. And so I think what you're going to see from us is partnerships that are born in authenticity. If it makes sense authentically, we'll lean into those conversations. Uh, and trust me, we're saying no to a lot of potential partnerships. You know, when you're entrusted to build a brand with Jay-Z, it, it gives you some instant credibility. So I'm getting a lot of inbound phone calls from people I won't tell you about on this call who we have to say <laughs> no to because it actually is not, I can't make the authentic connection to why they're in the industry other than it's a hot industry to be a part of. It's pretty cool to tell your friends you have a cannabis brand uh, and that's really not enough to really build something that's going to be meaningful and sustainable long-term. 
From a brand strategy standpoint, the, this question is from AB from Twitter. He wants to know about the higher end mids to compete against Lowell Farms and Cookies. Is there a plan in the future for that? Yeah, I mean, if I tell you all the plans, then I have to kill you guys, right? But um, <laughs> no, right now we've got brands that are, um, I think, too crowded in terms of where they compete. And so we got to pull some of those things apart and make sure that we are developing brands that that deliver against a wide swath of consumer needs. I think we got to figure it out on the high end. So, you know, if you think about the luxury in a cannabis, which is only about 4% of the marketplace, that's where Monogram and Jay's brand sits. And then we've got some brands kind of uh, in that mid-tier range um, that are competing against each other. So we've got to do some work some, and we're going to do some consumer work. And my next big hire will be a, a chief marketing officer, um, someone that can help us with uh, our brand journey and making sure that we've got the right portfolio that meets a wide swath of needs in the in the uh, in, in in the cannabis category. So we we've got some work to do to pull those things apart. But yes, we we are going to be competing in all segments and tiers, and we have uh, lots of ideas in that space. And it's just not it's not no lack of ideas. It's really around the strategic direction that needs to be. Uh, at the foundation of, of uh, building those brands and we need to go do some work and we will be doing some work in that, in that space. So yes, to answer the question, more to come there. I have a question about competing, um, especially in like the flower space. It's probably the largest sector, especially in California and other states as well. And it is kind of going towards more of like a commodity marketplace, right? And so I know that um, there is a movement within like the California marketplace, if you will, to kind of try to emphasize on like the Appalachian, right? And so I don't know, like, where do you fall kind of on that uh, spectrum? Are you more kind of favoring uh, regulations to, to shake the market as a, an Appalachian kind of marketplace similar to wine? Or do you think that regardless of that, it's just going to totally head towards commoditization of the flower? Yeah, I, I do think, you know, the commoditization we largest links, largely seen has been on outdoor um, and, you know, the good news is that really quality indoor flower has has held up a, a bit more resiliently in the face of commoditization. So hopefully that continues to play out. Um, I do think that these appellations and regions will will become important, um, especially as I think, you know, as you think about federal legalization and the ability to export the product to other states. I think people will look to regions. Um, you know, I, I as I entered this industry, I had a lot of people giving me some advice, right? Um, a lot of people who I didn't know were cannabis consumers until I, I came into the industry. A lot of people came to me and said, hey, let me give you my point of view and perspective. And I've got some friends who they come to my house and they, they look at our portfolio of products and, and they ask questions around Appalachians and regions. And they're like, I only smoke things from Humboldt. So I'm like, very okay, cool. And, and without like asking about quality or, or anything of that nature, like Humboldt is it. That's the only reason I spoke from. And, and, and so I think there's something there. I've been spending some time talking to some folks who are, have a really long-term view of this industry, who are um, working to build out destination uh, opportunities in these Appalachian regions. So think about you go to Napa today for wine tasting. And there are hundreds of wineries there, right? So I know that these towns that are, are known for their cannabis cultivation and the products that, that are grown there, the quality of the products, they are thinking about how do I create a destination for people who are interested in this industry to come out and visit. And they'll, they'll build tasting experiences and sampling experience and education. And so um, I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to talk to some folks who are who have some interest in those areas. And so I, I do see that being something that we have to all pay attention to long term. But but uh, yes, I think there'll be a lot of that marketing and appeal because um, very similar to wine, there's there is some magic to um, you know the topography and climate and those things that produce really good product. What's one concept or fact that you've learned in the cannabis industry that would shock, let's say, outside industry executives looking to make the jump in? That's a great question. No one's asked me that one uh, so far. I, you know, the one thing that's been shocking to me is really the quality and care and in, in terms of the the products that's being developed. Like I, I don't think people understand the, the amount of research development and science that goes into what we're doing. Uh, you know, I'm I'm actually 
fortunate enough to, to have someone that I'm very familiar with who leads our innovation at, at the parent company. You know, his name is Steve Winchell. Steve actually was the R&D lead, innovation leader for Burt Spees, which is a part of Clorox. And he actually was the R&D leader for Clorox, the billion dollar brand. Uh, and so I, when I got here, I knew that there was likely a lot of science, technology, and um, quality behind innovation because Steve was leading it. And I know that's you know what he's done for the last couple of decades. And I think for folks who are on the outside, they probably don't understand like how much goes into that. And actually, it goes into us telling our story versus the illicit market. It's a really interesting story that I think hasn't been told incredibly well yet. But I think most people would be shocked at how sophisticated these operations are. It's been shocking for me as I've traveled the U.S. and uh, I was just with a a competitor. Uh, I, I used to wear loosely a competitor uh, last week. I was touring their facility and just taking a look at their operations and you know the amount of investment that people are putting into this industry is is is, re- is remarkable and it's actually reassuring because it, you know then you can really make promises that you can keep when it comes to quality and safety. And that part is, is pretty remarkable. And I, I think I, as an outsider, people probably don't know the amount of regulations that are a part of this industry, you know, that things are tracked really from sea to sail um, meticulously and, uh, and the cost and complexity that adds to operators like, like yourselves and, and others. And, and I think those things would be very interesting. But I, I tell my friends, you know, the water's warm here. The ground's pretty solid. You know, you should take a look at the industry. And uh, and I think that, you know, as I continue to to talk to people who are on the other side of the fence, assuring them that this is a legit industry that has a lot of longevity to it. And we're, I'm seeing a lot of interest from consumer products, packaged goods, and uh, executives to, to move into the space, which I think is really going to be good long term. Yeah, I think it's good for everyone involved. And it really says something for you to say with your background about the regulations. If there's a lot there, I can only imagine kind of the perspective you had kind of pre and then going in and all that you've learned. So I want to stay with the science real quick. From the branding standpoint, is the parent company doing any science to validate the, the brands and to stand behind the products they create? Well, absolutely. Um, and we, we spend quite a bit of time doing that work. And the interesting thing that I found uh, in being here is we're making quality decisions, promise decisions around building a promise behind these brands that the consumer doesn't even know about yet. We, we haven't even found a way to talk to them about the amount of science and technology that goes into the product that, that we're producing. And so I actually see it as a really a big upside for us when we get a chance to actually do a bit of that. I want to take people behind the scenes to, to look at the science that goes into developing our products. I want them to go behind the scenes to see the things we say no to that they never see that comes to market because it doesn't meet the quality or expectation. We have. I don't think people probably understand that part from the outside. And I'm not sure if the illicit market has that same level of rigor. You know, if you get a bad crop in the illicit market, do you still bring it to market? Probably so. Uh, with us, you know, we're saying no to things because, again, brands stand on a promise. And if you can't deliver on that promise of quality first, then, uh, then you know, it, 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 uh, you can erode the, the trust you're building pretty quickly. And, and we take that stuff very seriously. I think it's also serious for the industry from a cultural stigma standpoint. You know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt about it. So one of my favorite things about what your team is doing is the social equity venture fund. So can you share more about that, the, the origin of that and kind of the current aspects and, and the hopes of going forward? Yeah, I'm really excited about this work. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting with our leadership team next week to, to, to work on our strategy uh, for the coming year in this very important area. You know, you, you've seen the headlines on a couple of the partnerships that we brought to market in the course of the last year. One is Josephine and Billy's, which is a female Black-owned uh, dispensary in Los Angeles. Um, shout out to, to Ebony and, and the team there. They've done a great job of creating a really interesting environment uh, for women to, to uh, come in and learn and get educated about the industry. They've curated some really great products and great lineup to speak to that consumer and really proud of the work that Ebony and Whitney are doing in Los Angeles. And then Jesse Grundy, who's a young entrepreneur here in Oakland, where I live, um, I love a lot about this town. And this town has produced people like Jesse, who has created a brand called Peaks, which is a, a brand that brings 
cannabis and culture and music together. And uh, we were featuring Jesse's brand in our ecosystem and spending time making sure that he has the capital means, but also the infrastructure and the know-how to be successful in an incredibly crowded space. And so I, we think that it's important to invest in these young entrepreneurs to build equity uh, and an opportunity for folks of color to be a part of this industry. And, you know, I, I mentioned uh, in an interview just the other day that, you know, I, I worked in the consumer products package goods industry for 30 years, and we spent a great deal of time trying to retrofit the industry. To Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo, coming this May 12th to the 15th to Metro Toronto Convention Center. Level up your industry intel at the Lift Cannabis Business Conference, plus connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250 plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lift Co. Expos, prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. Include folks where this industry has an opportunity to do it at the beginning. So you don't have to go do all that other work to like retrofit and have programs to address it. Like if you can just build it from the ground up, then it'll be reflective of the communities in which we live, work, and serve, which I think is all that we're all trying to do together. And so I'm excited about this work. Um, I'm not very preachy, so I don't tell people this is right or wrong. You should be doing it. What we want to do is be the example of how to do it. And so um, we've got those two successful launches out in market. We'll continue to work with them to ensure their success. And then we're looking to add a couple other examples to our to our roster of partnerships over the course of the next year. So important, action over the words. Absolutely, the words and pictures always have to match, for sure. Always. So I have a question about it. Yeah. Gonna, can we stay on that topic? Is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that, come on. No, I just <laughs> wanted to do your all thing. Right. All right, all right. <laughs> My question is what size, of, uh, what size and stage of companies do you guys kind of focus on with that equity fund? Is it kind of any entrepreneur that's, got a business plan and kind of a, a glimmer in their eyes? Are you kind of looking for more of a kind of later stage, post-revenue? They're kind of looking to pour gas on the fire kind of opportunity, or is it everything in between? It's really, you know, I'd say it's probably been more the latter up until now. I think we want to open the door for entrepreneurs at all stages. Because, you know, if you think about most of these entrepreneurs, this is the first time they've actually ventured into owning a business. And so, you know, we're doing a lot of work up front saying, here are the types of things we're looking for um, in order to make an investment. And one of the things you're going to hear from us is a call to action from other operators to join us on this journey. You know, we don't see this as a competitive advantage. Like this is, we're not doing this for like market share reasons. We will actually want to do it as an example, inspire others to be a part of this and invite them to bring money to the table so that we can service all of these entrepreneurs. The really sad thing is we're, we're going to have to say no to a lot of people. We have to say no to a lot of ideas because we don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to execute against all of them. And that's what's really disappointing about this work is there's no shortage of folks who, who need the help. It's just a shortage of resources, time, energy, um, in order to, to invest. And so we're, 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 um, we're trying to really expand that funnel to get with people who may just have an inkling of an idea. Um, and that's not been what we've done in, in the past, but we like to do more of that. So Tiffany McBride leads that work for us. And the thing that Tiffany and I have talked about is setting aside a portion of our dollars for these, call it long shot ideas. No, any successful business when I was at Clorox or, uh, or my previous experiences, there was always, call it 10% of any investment fund, call it innovation fund, that was set aside around these like moonshot ideas, like these really crazy ideas that you're not betting the farm on because you're, you're actually, it's like a 10% chance they're actually going to be successful. But if it, if it actually comes to fruition, it could be major. Right. But but the small likelihood it'll be successful. I want to make sure we set aside dollars for that 10 percent that we take. So we lean in and take some chances in some areas where we're not quite sure if it's going to work. Uh, but somebody has a really crazy idea, um, a really. And we like the entrepreneur, you know, like them even more than, you know, 
understand their business plan. I've seen so many examples of folks who have said, I invested in the person because I like them. Like, I didn't understand what they were up to. Like, I didn't know the plan, but like, I just believed in that person. I want to do a little bit of that. And right now we're not built for that, but but I'd love to get to a place where we can do more of that. I love so, that. It's so important too, to bet on the jockey right that in those opportunities. So I was eager to ask New York strategy, obviously with Jay-Z and your team, is there a a thought process, can we expect some, some parent company presence in the tri-state area in the future? What I say is we're working really hard at that. And, you know, we have a ambition to be in that Northeast corridor. Um, you know, as, as cannabis becomes recreational legal, we want to be there. But the, the first and foremost, it's about the quality of the product and whether or not we, we, we have the right partners to help with, get us the quality that's required to meet the expectation that we have for Monogram. I mentioned at the early part of the conversation, Monogram is competing really in that really upper echelon of cannabis uh, consumers, that four, top 4% that really expect high quality. We're having some interesting conversations with partners around where they are today with quality and what we need to see before we can say yes. The great news is there's a lot of interest and there are people working really hard to get to that level of quality. But I, but I, I can't actually put a timeline on it because it's really driven by the quality, not by like my timing. As a CEO, I'd say yes. Um, let's go to every state that cannabis is legal tomorrow. And you know, the good news is that um, because we have uh, Jay Z and Rock Nation behind the initiative, there's a lot of interest. The qu- good question is, can we deliver against the quality? And we can be patient. We will be patient. Um, and we ask for all those folks who are um, who are looking forward to experiencing the product to be patient with us because when we do deliver, we want to meet that expectation. Actually, we want to exceed it. And that takes time and, and the right partners to do that. So, but I'm, I'm anxious to make those announcements. I'm, I'm interested in going to that Northeast corridor and beyond actually. And uh, we, we're, we're just you know trying to make sure we have the right partners to help us execute that plan. Well said. Let's do a quick rapid fire. Sounds good. Most bullish category over the next 10 years. Wow, that's a great one. Beverages. Love Beverages. That. And I think uh, cannabis consumption will be will move to this really social area where it's not about you're gonna take it out of the shadows. You know, I think I think right now things are about being discreet. And again, I think people are stepping their way into being open about their use of cannabis. And I think different form factors will help with that. Beverages will be one of those. And the second thing is that there will be places where consumption will be allowed. And so that with the, with the development of consumption lounges, it'll take away that stigma, I think, as well. And so beverages, I think, will be at the center of that. And I'm excited about that being a part of the journey. Five to 10 years from now, a parent company brand will sponsor a world tour. Absolutely. And uh, no doubt about it. We're having some interesting conversations with partners today about that now. We're just waiting for the right opportunity, but absolutely part of of what I think you'll see from brands like ours. A year from now, we're sitting here having a conversation. What has the parent company accomplished? Expansion uh, of our brand portfolio outside of the state of California, Uh, you know, in a limited focused approach. The other thing is, I think 22 is going to be a year of carnage in 20 in California oh. and with that little access to capital. And I think in 23, we'll be well positioned to go on a um, expansion, even further expansion aggressively in California. Um, you know, one of the things we have going for us versus others candidly is our balance sheet. And I'm working really hard with my team to protect that over the next 12 months um, so that in 2023, we can look at what's available. And I think there'll be a lot of interesting assets available in 23. We want to be positioned for that. Since you've been in the cannabinoid industry, what has been the biggest misconception? You know, I, I think that it's, uh, that I, I think American sentiment is way ahead of where our politicians and the laws are. And so I, I think there's a misconception of that, that this is not as mainstream as it really is. You know, one of the things that we've seen in the course of the, the last past year for us is a mainstreaming of, of mainstreaming of locations and where our dispensaries sit. You know, I've got a couple of locations now that are in 
parking lots with retailers like Costco and others, right? And um, I've got some locations that we had at the very beginning of legalization in California that looked like you're going down an industrial road to do a drug deal, right? I, I, it feels like, like, why would I go down this road? Like, it, it's only to do a drug deal, right? And so the more that we can actually mainstream it, I, I think um, American sentiment's already there. It's about how do we catch up with these zoning laws and all these other things, get those things fixed so that we can bring sentiment closer to the reality. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you could sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation, what would it be? Take the risk. You know, I, I, you know, I think this is uh, my move to this industry is all about um, taking a risk. And I didn't, didn't know what it was going to be like. I, I didn't have many friends that were in the industry, but, but, you know, it's going to take, you know, real practical business experience from you know, these industries that have stood the test of time for hundreds of years to bring to this new emerging industry. And I'd say, uh, don't be afraid to make the leap. Really well said. All right, prediction time. Troy, what mega policy causes more disruption to the future of the cannabis industry? Federal legalization or interstate commerce? Ooh, you got to make me choose between those two. <laughs> I'm going to have to go last, so I got a worse situation than you. That That's unfair. Um I think federal legalization is just so far off. It, it, it just, it can't, I can't even wrap my head around it. So I'll have to say uh, the interstate commerce. I, I, I'd have to lean on that, yeah. Why do you think it causes more disruption? Well, I, I just think that like, well, if you don't, we're seeing it now kind of a microcosm from ca- like county to county, municipality to municipality in, in, in California. You know, if someone wants to attract cannabis to its, its, a city, it just lowers the taxes. So you got like this really wonky thing where, like I was meeting with a, a, a mayor of a city uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I was explaining to him, I'm like, hey, do you do understand that the, the municipality next door to you has a very different tax rate? I'm not threatening you. I'm not saying that we're going to pack up and move next door, but it would make sense as a business owner to do that. And I think states are going to compete. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, you know, if we don't get in, in, in front of this thing, we could have a really wonky industry that is not uh, built the way you would build any industry for success. So I think we'll we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. You know, I was going to go legalization, but that point you just made about taxes, I think that honestly, interstate commerce will be more disruptive because you could federally legalize it, right? And every state could kind of figure out how to do what they want with it. But if you let interstate commerce happen, I mean, there could be states that never, ever grow cannabis at all. Yeah. They just literally import it the whole time. They never even had the opportunity to build a brand or build any market or anything. Yeah. They just accepted what California has been building, for instance, right? So I, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to jump on that boat. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it's no problem. I'm going to take the other side. So I, I think federal legalization is going to cause more disruption because I think currently in cannabis, we've got big MSOs who are all competing for market share. But yeah. I think the one missing piece of the current puzzle is these monster fishes outside like Clorox, like Pepsi and like Coke that are ready to come into the space. And I don't think they enter the space maybe legal or I guess on yeah. top and, and, and up allowed until federal legalization happens. And when that happens, the game kind of completely changes oh. because it yeah. is just Titans fighting Titans and it is a very different game space. So I think federal legalization causes more industry disruption. Yeah, I, I, you know, I can go, like I said, I think it's a very tough question. <laughs> yeah. But the interesting thing, I think, you know, the, the company that I'm trying to build is one that um, that has that in state in mind. You know, I think that if you think about the companies, the consumer products companies that are sniffing around the industry, and it's one of the reasons why actually I hired the Boston Consulting Group to help us, because that's the company people are calling is for sniffing. So they actually know us better than probably any other company in cannabis, right? So that's part of the secret sauce. But but what's interesting is I think that those companies will look to one, the balance sheet, like can they run a business? But two, like who's running the business? And I, I think none of them will integrate these companies into their portfolio right away. They're going to acquire the company. Look, They want the benefit of owning it, but they're not going to integrate. So they'll leave them like on the sideline and, and they're going to need really competent people who have done this 
in major industries to be the people that they trust to run those those companies. And so, you know, I want to build a company that speaks that language. People that have big corporate Fortune 500 industry experience, they've, you know, talked to investors, they've met with analysts, like bringing that experience to the table will make it more comfortable for those companies to invest in companies like ours because they they say, hey, these these folks have done that. They understand our language. They know what we want out of leaders and and they're going to build the kind of company we're going to be proud of. And then at some point, federal legalization comes in, you you integrate these things and it you know, it just becomes, to your point, the titans. I think as we, 15 years from now, it'd be interesting to see who actually owns this space. Yeah. Um, to your point, if we should get together for a cocktail in 10 years and, Yes. Yeah, well, and maybe off the record we can have our predictions because I don't want to you know, put, put it in a hat, like, yeah, lock, like store it away, and then away. It, that'd be great. Meet me in Vegas. <laughs> we'll have a bottle base of spade and have some monogram <laughs> and talk about it. That sounds yes, great. So for Troy, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to learn more about you and the company. Where can they reach you? They can go to a, you know you can just Google the parent company and and find us there. I'm I'm on LinkedIn and. You know, I'm the only Troy Datch in the world, I think I found out. <laughs> and uh, and so it's easy to find me. I can't really escape or go anywhere. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing from folks. And, uh, you know, we're trying to build a team. team. If you got some talents you want to bring to California, bring those talents. Got some ideas, uh, send them our way. Uh, we're looking for good ideas, partners, and, and, and like-minded people. Awesome. We'll link it all up in the show notes. Thanks so much for your time, Troy. Thank you. We'll talk soon. I'm Gary, and I invite you to discover the Cannabis Podcast, a bi-weekly podcast focused on a Canadian's cannabis culture. I would be the Canadian, and my cannabis passion and culture has been building for five decades. I share that passion for this wonderful plant in every episode, through conversations with cannabis advocates and enthusiasts, stories about the ever-changing legal environment, and some hands-on testing of product in a segment I call Cultivar Corner. The Cannabis Podcast, a Canadian's cannabis culture, one token at a time.